Lord, we believe these truths. We believe that the Bible is your word, that it has authority to speak into the moment that we live in today. The Spirit of God, I pray that you would illuminate these words. I pray that not only would our mind be able to understand what you have for us this morning, but that our hearts, by your power, would be opened up to the transforming work that you do in all of us, because we believe that you change everything, Jesus. So God, right now in this moment, it can be so easy to miss this. It can be so easy for each of us to be distracted. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to unplug from all the distractions from our life and just to rest in these words. I pray you give us an eagerness to hear from you. I pray you help us to have a posture of honesty, of transparency. I pray, Lord, that as we learn from your word that is it, God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, I pray, Spirit of God, that you would give us hearts that are willing to receive that. So have your way. We believe you. Let me pray this together in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this morning, we're looking at the Bible been thinking about these two weeks of we preaching. Last week we talked about the value of community groups and, and being in a group and, and of service and, and thinking about some of the core convictions when people ask, why do you do things a certain way? Why do we, why do we always have a reading plan that we want our, our people to be reading their Bibles together? Why, why are all of our community groups centered around the Bible? And, and we believe that's a part of, 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 of how we learn and how we grow. Today we're going to be looking at a, a key text in Scripture that helps us understand why this is a core conviction here. And the question that I think we ask is, why should I treasure the Bible? Why should I treasure the Bible? Many would say, especially in today's day and age, that, that, that's an old, ancient, dead book. There are, there are people who would actually say, actually, uh, in our society that, that the Bible has is, is been used to, to weaponize things that they're very much against. That it's been used to say things, to, to, to oppress people, to, to, to give justification for the oppression of others. And so as we look at the Bible, we recognize that there are very real concerns that people have. That our society tells, tells, tells a story that even our own flesh sometimes says, well, I get it, but it's just so boring. When I read that, I, or it's so, so hard, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. And so as we look at this and ask this question, I believe that today the Lord is reminding us of why we are a people who are called to treasure the treasure to truly treasure the treasure. That the Bible is, is, is truly a treasure given to you and I. And we can miss this because we become so familiar with this, right? Because it's, it's so accessible now. And because we get so distracted, but we miss this call to be a people who treasure the treasure. In the text that we're looking at in 2 Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy. Scholars believe that he was in his second imprisonment, that he was most likely on his way to death. We learn in the context that Paul, as he's writing to Timothy, says that he's, he's persecuted, that, that Timothy has seen the pain and the struggle, that the church has seen the pain and the struggle, and he's, and he's telling Timothy to continue on, to continue to grow. And as he's talking to Timothy, he's also saying, right now in this moment, there are, he calls them deceivers who are also deceived. 
He's saying right now in your moment, Timothy, there are people who are saying, you know what? You don't need to follow that way. You don't need to, you don't need to go by the ways of God. Those are ancient. Those are old. Those are, those are wrong. We need to follow today's day. And as Paul was writing to Timothy, he calls him to remember the treasure. Look at what it says in verse 14. He says, but as for you, he just talked about the deceivers in 13. He talked about people who were coming and they were really just trying to distract and divide and discourage the church. He said, it can be easy to fall into this crowd. He says, but as for you, he's, he's, he's singling out Timothy. He says, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. As Paul is writing to Timothy, and, and we're asking this question, why should I treasure the Bible? Paul is telling Timothy, because there's more to learn. It's like, it's like the tip of the iceberg. Have you guys ever learned about icebergs? We have this phrase called the tip of the iceberg, where you look at an iceberg and it looks like not very big, but you all know in icebergs, that it's, it's what's underneath the water that is gigantic and huge. And Paul was recognizing that as we look at Scripture, as he's calling Timothy to grow in his faith and in his learning and knowledge of who God is and, and his call to be a part of the family of God and the mission of the kingdom of God, that this is just the tip of the iceberg. That in following the Lord, like you never stop learning. This word called sanctification, growing and growing. Like there's this part of, of being a child of God that where you're just constantly growing. And he, he's telling Timothy, listen, you don't just ever get there. You're continuing to grow. And he tells him, he, he's telling Timothy, continue to learn from the people you've learned. And who has he learned from? We learn in First, uh, First Timothy 1 verse 5, he says... That, that's not that. It's uh, earlier in uh, uh, Timothy, as he's talking to, you know, the, the church, he, said, he tells them that they, they've learned, Timothy learned from his mother and his grandmother. That he had been growing up in the faith and his mother and his grandmother had, had brought him up in the scriptures, in the holy scriptures, and he was growing in that. He had been learning in that. And he's calling the church, and he's calling Timothy and this young church to grow in the Word. And so maybe as, as we ask this question, how does he grow? Why should I treasure the Bible? It seems to me that he gives us three really important pieces, core foundational pieces for why we believe the Bible to be so important. First piece is special revelation. Special revelation, what does that mean? It changes you. Remember in theology class, I got to learn about the difference between what we would call general revelation and special revelation. General revelation is that you look at, at, at nature and, and, or you look at the stars or, or you just think about our own consciousness and it just screams of a God. Special revelation has to do with your salvation. Special revelation has to do with this special revelation that you have, that you are in need of a Savior. And amazingly, God oftentimes gives us special revelation through His Word. That's how He has spoken. Look at what it says in verse 15. He says, And how from childhood, Timothy, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He's saying the Bible, the, the scriptures, and when he's saying the sacred writings, he's talking about the Old Testament, the Torah, the prophets, and he's, uh, the Psalms, and, and, he's, and Paul is saying, Timothy, when you were reading those, you recognized those weren't just about the do's and the don'ts. They weren't just, hear this, they weren't just a pep talk for you on how to live. They're good news for you that you need a savior. All the way back in Genesis 3 when we find out that we've fallen and that, that there's this sin problem, 
we see time and time again that we need a Savior, that there's this sin issue, and we see it in Jesus. And so as we think about our need to treasure the Scriptures, we recognize that the core foundational piece of the Scriptures is there's, there's this unified story that all leads to Christ. It's about Him, and it's the starting point here. We miss this sometimes. We, 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 we're so excited for verse 16. This verse 16 is a wonderful verse about, about that we're going to get to. But we miss that before Paul even gets into the usefulness and the authority of Scripture, he says the starting point is God's saving work in your life through Jesus Christ. That's the core piece of the Word of God, is special revelation that God has given this saving work, and He's doing the saving work through this. And so we have this special revelation for you and for me. Second, inspired authority. It doesn't just change you, it works in you. It works in you. As you read the Word of God, it does something in you. Why? Because it's inspired and has authority. Look at what he says in verse 16. He says, all Scripture is God-breathed. I'm going to say how I memorized it. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All Scripture is God-breathed. And the ESV is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. As we think about why should I value the scriptures, why, why, why do we constantly find ourselves being called into the word of God, called into our community groups and our Bible studies and our devotional life that, that we need to open up our Bibles, because we believe that God in his sovereignty, in his wonderful plan, gave us his word. And it's from him, and, and he didn't just zap a bunch of people, and, and, and he spoke through human beings in all these different ways, in all these different contexts and cultures, and, and we can learn that God has been speaking through his word. And so as we read it, we, we, we recognize this is from God for me, my creator, my designer, the, the one behind it all that we believe he's got something for me. And it's not, hear this, it's not just like a helpful guide for, for good life. It's not just like, this is good advice, and if you follow it, things will probably be okay. Don't miss the authority. If we truly believe that all Scripture is inspired, God breathes. If you read the Bible, and don't just read like the Instagram verses. Don't just read the Hobby Lobby verses, you know what I'm talking about, the ones that are on our wall. But like you really read the Bible, you will find yourself coming up against things that make you a little uncomfortable. You will find yourself coming up against things that make you squirm a little bit or, or you'll find yourself being corrected. You'll find yourself being rebuked. You'll find yourself being reminded of the greater call. You'll find yourself learning. You'll find yourself having questions and doubts. And Paul is inviting the people of God to lean into that. He's inviting Timothy to continue to learn because the word of God is authoritative. Why do we stand? Because we believe that the great and powerful God is going to speak through his word. It's not good advice. It's transforming powerful words. And so we see this. And there's a utility to it. As Paul's writing this, we were talking to our teaching team and a light bulb went on 
as one of the guys was talking, is he says, Paul says, all scripture is God breathed and is useful <laughs> for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. In God's sovereign ex like transcendence, he has given us his word that is useful for this moment that we live in, for today. Now that doesn't mean we don't need to understand the culture and the context and the original language and, and we can twist it and cause the Bible to say things that it doesn't say. We, that's why we have pastors and elders and seminaries and, and people to help us to, to, to not let our own flesh and our own struggles with this. But we're also called and invited in to study and grow and learn in it. It's useful for you today. I think that's one of the challenges we have is one of the lies that the enemy will tell us as we think, well, why should I treasure the Bible is I just don't find it useful. Third, complete equipping. Complete equipping. It empowers you. Look at what Timothy says here. He's, he's already talked about the usefulness. He says that the, that the word of God is useful. And then look at what he says here. He says that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get a little overwhelmed at life. I get a little overwhelmed sometimes at all the things that maybe God is putting on my heart or that I feel like he's leading me into, or maybe just about getting up in the morning. Maybe just taking care of my family. And here, Paul is reminding Timothy that God, through his word, has given you this incredible resource to fully equip you for the day, to fully equip you for your life ahead. It's everything that we need. And the key here is, it's not about us doing this. It's not about us, it's, it's, remember, remember the steps. First, it's for salvation. It's special revelation. That's the beginning point. And then after we understand this, the Lord is doing a work, and there's this correcting and, and, and rebuking and training and righteousness and empowering. So it starts with us just confessing, I need a Lord, I need a Savior, and that person is Jesus. And then from there we start saying, and Jesus is going to be teaching me as I grow in Him. And as I grow in Him, He's not waiting for me to get somewhere before I go. He's sending me as I'm growing. So we see this beautiful process of the grace of God, where God uses unqualified people to do his incredible work. It says in Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. You have no part in your salvation. It is a gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his, what? Workmanship. Some translations say masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. As you think about his empowering work in you, recognizing God has stuff for us to do in light of what he's done for us. It's that response. So if you're wondering today, thinking through, how, how can I truly trust the Bible? Or how, how do I get to a place where I can treasure it? I get that Logan, but when I wake up in the morning, how do I get to this, this space of, of, of believing and experiencing these truths? I, I want to experience the usefulness. I, I, want, to, I, I want to see Jesus in it. I, I want to be empowered by how do I get to this? And I'll tell you three things. First, Open the treasure.
open the treasure. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is what? Living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I don't even know if I need to comment on that. I think that's so powerful just by itself. We need to open the scriptures with this anticipation. I've been reading this book. It's called Analog Church. It's a response to the digital age and how oftentimes it's been said that, that we have started to be conditioned into this slot machine way of thinking. People have said that, that the, the designers and the, the people that made the algorithms for things like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and, and, all, and, and, and that they, they, they apply these algorithms to a science behind slot machines. Have you guys heard about this? So it's, it's been learned that our brains are, are, are wired where we have these slot machines and we have this experience where people go sit at a casino for an entire day because they're, 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 they're created to give you just enough to want more. You're sitting there and then you get a little win. You want more. And social media is kind of like that. You, you're looking through and you're posting something or you're looking for something and, and you're thinking, oh man, did I get any likes? Did I get any comments? Did I get any shares? Or did I miss anything? And so what do you do? You, you pull down on your phone for a refresh. And we're looking for just these little shallow truths. Even in our, in our devotional life, we're looking for a, a, a verse grabbed out of the Bible or a piece here or a piece there. And it seems to me that if we're going to treasure the treasure, if we're going to truly say, what does it look like? i got to open it up and spend some time really digging in. Really saying, if this is God's word for me, I really need to dig in to more than just the verse of the day. And, and, and I love the picture of truly, like, maybe I'm just an old soul, but opening up an actual book. I got nothing against phones and the Bible app. I use it every day. But there is something to me about just like the analog touch and feel of reading and opening up God's word with a heart that wants to grow and learn. So I would say, open the treasure. And as you open the treasure, seek the treasure. Seek the treasure. What, why am I opening this? Am I opening this to tell me how to have a good day? Am I opening this to, to tell me about three steps for me to conquer and be the best that I can be today? Or am I seeking the treasure that God has for me for today? In the Bible, as Jesus was, we learn in, from his life when he was here on earth, there were these scribes and Pharisees who would open the Bible regularly and they would look in the Torah and they would study it and they would search it. And they had all this knowledge. And then Jesus comes along and he tells them that they've been missing it. Look at what he said in John chapter 5, verse 39. He says, you search the scriptures. Because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. He says, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. My, in other words, oftentimes we may search the scriptures, but we're missing that they're about Jesus, that they're about grace, that they're about the gospel, that they're about us responding. And so as we search the scriptures, find Jesus in them. Find the gospel in them. One of my favorite quotes is from this guy named Charles Spurgeon. You guys ever heard of him? Yes, Logan, you talk about him all the time. One of, he, he, in this, he, he wrote about this, this understanding 
as a people of God, as a preacher, that we must always be looking for Christ. And he tells this story. He says that there was this old minister, and he was sitting, and there was this young minister wanting to impress him, and so he sat through his sermon. And the, the young man said, well, how did I do? What did you think of my message? And he said, if I must tell you, I did not like it at all. There was no Christ in your sermon. The young man said, well, I did not see that Christ was in the text. And the old minister said, but do you not know that from every little town and village and tiny hamlet in England, there is a road leading to London? The old minister said, whenever I get a hold of a text, I say to myself, there is a road from here to Jesus Christ, and I mean to keep on his track till I get to him. And the young man said, but suppose you are preaching from a text that says nothing about Christ. And the old man said, then I will go over hedge and ditch, but what I will get to him. We believe that the scriptures are a unified story of a God who created us in his image to be in a perfect relationship of humanity, image bearers who have sinned against God and are in need of a savior. And we believe that the story of scriptures is about God himself sending his son to die on a cross for you and I so that we can be restored back to that relationship. That's the story. That's the gospel. Seek the treasure. Version says this. I believe that those sermons which are fullest of Christ are the most likely to be blessed to the conversion of the hearers. Let your sermons be full of Christ. From beginning to end, crammed full of the gospel. As for myself, brethren, I cannot preach anything but Christ and his cross. For I know nothing else. And long ago, like the Apostle Paul, I determined not to know anything else save Jesus Christ and him crucified. People have often asked me, what is the secret of your success? I always answer that I have no other secret but this, that I have preached the gospel. Not about the gospel, but the gospel. The full, free, glorious gospel of the living Christ who is the incarnation of the good news. Preach Jesus Christ, brethren, always and everywhere. And every time you preach, be sure to have much of Jesus Christ in your sermon. In summary, Jesus changes everything, amen? Amen. So seek the treasure. And finally, treasure the treasure. Treater the treasure. (laughs) Is that typo, Alex, yeah? Treasure the treasure. Church, I, I feel like we can get so distracted sometimes the core message of this. That God's given us this this treasure. And we should treasure it. It, It's valuable. It's useful. Above all, it, it, it draws you to Christ. And it can just get so easy to get distracted. I love this quote, the, the Gideons. These are the, this is the ministry that puts Bibles in every single hotel room. They go to campuses and pass out Bibles. They write this about the Bible. It says this, the Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Immutable means unchanging. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. And practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. 
Here too, heaven is open and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life, will be opened at the judgment, and be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, rewards the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. That's a, that's a treasure. And church, I would just encourage you not to miss this. And maybe you're starting to think about the how-tos. But Logan, I, I get that. But tomorrow morning I wake up and, and my kids, they still wake up too. I, I think one of the things that, that the Lord has really been working on me is that to truly treasure things, we have to build habit into our life. Like we have to find ways to open it. We have to, to try our hardest to say, I, I, I believe these things to be true, but my habits will show you what I truly value. Full confession this week as I am preaching about God's word. I did not do very good this week in spending time in his word. I did a lot of prepping for this sermon. But it can be easy as a pastor sometimes to spend so much time thinking about what I'm going to tell you that I forget about what God's telling me, like for me and my family. As I was thinking about this, and my prayer is that I will treasure the treasure, that I will wake up and first thing in the morning, I'll open up my Bible. I'll journal, I'll pray. And when I'm with my family and we have a meal that, that, that we'll open up our Bible, that we'll read it together. That we'll believe that, that, yeah, sometimes it may not feel like, oh, I'm having this incredible rainbows and butterflies moment. But there's something about the everyday. I can tell you just from talking to these saints and people that have, have lived their lives in God's word, it becomes their treasure as it starts to do its work in you. But to truly treasure something, you got to stay in it. Think about marriages. Marriages that have, I, I talk to people, couples that have been 50 plus years. They'll tell you that it does get better, but there's challenges and struggles and, and they have to lean into each other. And if, if you just become, you know, ships in the night, you miss it. And how oftentimes in our faith do we do this with God? He gives us his word and yet I'm not truly listening to him for what he has for my day, for my family, for my future. I believe that he empowers me. I believe that he can teach me. I believe that he can rebuke me, correct me, and train me in righteousness. But I just hope that maybe on Sunday he can speak through that. Or maybe in this podcast or, or maybe on, the, on this, this follow that I have. And we just miss the fact that God oftentimes will speak through his word to you and I. So take some time, I would encourage you, to open the treasure. Seek the treasure, Christ himself, and treasure the treasure. Let's pray. Lord, as we reflect on this, God, I pray, God, that you are encouraging us. It is so hard, Lord, Oftentimes, to truly spend some, the time in your word. But Lord, whenever we do, you speak. And God, you're not finished with us. 
You, you have words for us. You have truths for us. You have promises for us. Your grace is all over this. And I pray, Lord, that, that as we together seek to seek you, as we go on these Bible plans and we, and, we, and we get in groups and we talk about all these things, God, I pray that we would not neglect our time to truly sit at your feet and learn from you. I pray, God, that even right now as we reflect on this, as we listen and sing together, God, that, that you would do your work. I pray that you would inspire us to, to open the, the treasure you've given us, to seek the treasure and to treasure it. And God, we believe that only happens by your spirit. So I pray that your spirit would graciously guide us as a family of God. We believe this. We trust you to work. In your name we pray. Amen.